Welcome to the March episode of the Cyber Expanse, where we bring you the latest cybersecurity news in a short and digestible format so that you can stay informed. So the first story of the day is actually about Screen Connect, the widely used remote access software, which recently had two vulnerabilities that were patched in their 23.9.8 update. This was recently addressed in their security advisory post by their company ConnectWise. The first of which actually had a CVSS 10 score, which is the highest score possible. And to make matters worse, it's apparently trivial and embarrassingly easy to exploit, according to security experts. Hey! Come on, man! That's too easy! The flaw enables black hats to bypass authentication entirely and take remote control of connected client devices to exfiltrate data or deploy malicious code. For those of you who may not be familiar with Screen Connect, it's actually the backbone of over a million businesses, some of whose accounts have been compromised as a result of this glaring high severity vulnerability. The international cybersecurity firm Huntress has been digging into the details for us after dropping a proof of concept, which don't worry guys, I've linked below. They've also revealed that they're aware of active exploitation of the floor out in the wild. And now whilst 80% of ConnectWise's customers are cloud-based and were patched automatically within the first 48 hours, Huntress CEO has revealed that over 8,800 servers still remain vulnerable and has raised concerns for potential ransomware free-for-all surge. The gravity of the situation also aligns with broader warnings from US government agencies about cyber campaigns targeting remote monitoring and desktop services after any desk was also recently abused by hackers. So if you or any organization you're affiliated with are using Screen Connect, please update yourselves as soon as possible. Monitor for any signs of compromise and remain vigilant against any potential future threats. Please remember to stay secure, guys. Now the next two stories are from the motherland, Russia. The Advanced Persistent Threat, or APT, cyber espionage group Winter Vyvern, also known as TAG70, has recently exploited a zero-day cross-site scripting vulnerability within Roundcube's webmail servers, affecting over 80 organizations all over Europe, predominantly government and military in Georgia, Poland, and other neighboring countries. Winter Vyburn are actually quite experienced in compromising email servers, having their activity dating back to at least 2020, with this more recent attack sharing many similarities to their prior engagements in respect to tactic techniques and procedures, try saying that five times fast, by way of phishing emails, website spoofing, as well as many code similarities, and the reuse of the following domains. The cross-site scripting vulnerability exploited allowed them to list and exfiltrate the contents of victims' mailboxes without any interaction from the victims themselves. Them seemingly opening a seemingly harmless email was enough for them to fall prey to this sophisticated attack. As Roundcube had a security flaw that permitted stored cross-site scripting through a HTML email message within an SVG image graphics tag enabling attackers to potentially load and execute malicious JavaScript code. With the following image provided to us by Recorded Future, detailing the process of Winter Vyburn's latest engagement. This compromise of email servers, especially during times of heightened geopolitical tensions, poses significant risks beyond simply exposing sensitive information related to military and political affairs. It also provides opportunities for manipulation of certain communication channels, undermining the security of affected countries. Winter Vyburn's exploitation of a zero-day Roundcube vulnerability highlights the ongoing challenges in defending against the many APTs all over the globe as organizations worldwide face escalating cyber espionage campaigns, responsible disclosure of vulnerabilities, addressing immediate risks, and further fostering long-term cybersecurity improvements are imperative in mitigating the impact of such sophisticated threat actors. Now, most of you have heard of the Australian Medibank breach in October 2022, where the personal data of a staggering 9.7 million customers was released, including their sensitive health information. The attackers, in a bold move, demanded ransom money and even published a portion of the data on the dark web. More than a year later, we've identified the primary culprit. Jesus Christ, it's Alexander Ermakov, a 33-year-old Russian citizen who has made headlines for his involvement in numerous cyber threats as well. 
In Australia, Irma Cobb himself was sanctioned for his involvement in the unauthorised release and publication of the compromised records on To The Dark Web. The repercussions were quite severe, as it became criminal offence under law to provide Irma Cobb with any assets whatsoever, including cryptocurrency or ransomware payments, or the like, with penalties of up to 10 years in prison for those caught dealing with him. But as alluded to earlier, his cyber escapades did not stop there. He was also involved in the notorious Sugar Locker ransomware, which he hit his own homeland with, taking aim at organizations like Russia's CIS or Commonwealth of Independent States. The Russian authorities later identified him as a member of the Sugar Locker group under the following aliases. After a group under the, operated under the Geisman IT firm providing web development services, they slipped up, misconfigured their web server on some Russian hosting sites, and as of the 22nd of February, this whole ordeal has seemingly concluded, after the Australian Federal Police received reports that he was apprehended in Russia by their authorities for his cyber crimes. Now it's time for the security snippets. Some of you may have heard of Magica, the machine learning file type identifier by Google. It uses file data as opposed to file extensions or heuristics to provide greater accuracy in the identification process of files as it can correctly identify files in milliseconds with a 99% accuracy rate. Whilst initially rolled out through their Google services, such as Gmail, Google Drive, VirusTotal, and more, Magic has now finally broken free of Google's shackles. Dobby is free. As they have now open sourced it as part of their Google AI cyber defense initiative allowing anyone, especially those in network defense, to leverage the power of AI to defend their systems with capabilities such as malware analysis and intrusion detection through fast and scalable identification of malicious file content. This will allow us cyber defenders to help better fend against the ever-growing threat of the application of AI in offensive security, which is something that Microsoft and OpenAI just recently warned us about after correctly identifying five state-sponsored hackers utilizing artificial intelligence in their attacks. So yeah, overall, a great move by Google, and something I didn't really expect from them since they removed Don't Be Evil from their motto in 2015. Now, I'm sure many of you are aware of, in fact, I'm sure many of you have, a Flipper Zero, the incredibly popular, small, affordable, all-in-one hacking device that can replicate and reproduce NFC, RFID, and sub-gigahertz frequencies natively, and with some tinkering, can even carry out de-authing attacks and more. Well, despite its utility in both penetration testing and in education, the Canadian government instead sees it as a dangerous car theft tool, despite any concrete evidence. The tool, which is ineffective at actually stealing cars, despite being able to replicate the frequency of car keys, due to what is known as a rolling code system, where a code is sent by a car key and received by a car. This then causes the code to then be marked off the car's registry and unable to be used again, instead replaced by another code in the, next in the sequence of a highly complex formula, meaning that the same code cannot be used twice. So the Flipper Zero can't really steal your car, but try telling Canada that. After a viral story of a thief who stole $2 million worth of iPhones revealed his tactics, Apple launched stolen device protection. The thief, Johnson, would use social engineering techniques, among other tactics, to obtain a user's phone passcode, after which he would use it to change the Apple ID password, disable Find My iPhone, and then erase the device and sell it off. By the end of it, he could apparently execute it, and I quote, faster than you could say, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Now to combat this, bundled in iOS 17.3 and later, the iPhone now requires your biometric data, such as fingerprint or face ID, in order to modify your Apple ID or biometric settings, thereby completely counteracting this vulnerability. Cybersecurity experts are giving this move a thumbs up calling it an extra roadblock for the tech-savvy thieves. And let's face it, in a world where stolen phones are a black market hotcake, any hurdle for the crooks is a win for us. But... Hold up! Wait a minute! Something ain't right! This setting isn't actually enabled by default, and needs to be turned on manually. So don't stress, I've provided a quick demo for you guys, so enjoy.
And finally, popular secure communications platform Signal, which has a long-standing reputation of being the gold standard of privacy, has counterintuitively always required you to expose a key piece of your personal information, your phone number, up until now. Whilst currently in beta as of writing this story, within the coming weeks, Signal should adopt usernames, allowing you to finally be even more anonymous online. So thank you very much for tuning in to this month's episode of The Cyber Expands. Please like, subscribe, and uh, drop a comment if there's anything you'd like to see next episode. See ya. Bye.